I have my class here, so I felt an obligation to do some exposition of Operatgeist because you all were not here this morning to hear from the authors themselves about the theory. But what I'm going to try and do is perhaps answer some of David's Bourdieu critiques. We had a very interesting discussion with students about the question of whether Operatgeist theory is a theory or a meta-concept or something schematic. And David also, I think, rightly asked for some historical context for this theory. And so as a historian of logic, I thought, number one, Mark and Jim say that there is a sociologic. So we have to take that very seriously. And as a philosopher of logic, I will think about that in my calls. And as an historian of logic, I will try to give us a little bit of history, which really will be kind of a just-so story, except that it is grounded in real things. So that's what I'll try to do. So I'm going to first say something about what strikes me. I'm not a sociologist, but what strikes me about what's novel and important about Operatgeist in terms of bringing in the social dimension, something that at least analytic philosophers tended to downplay, and I think in popular culture as well. Then I was going to give, I have about eight slides on Operatgeist theory, 1999. We've already talked, so I may zoom through some of those more quickly. I'll say a few words about Turing. So David, in answer to your question on behalf of Jim and Mark, I think Turing and Wittgenstein are the real resonant figures that in some sense lie behind this theory. And there's a reason why there's not a meta-theory because of the way they're conceiving of logic. And then I have a few questions about Operatgeist, but some of my questions were also David's questions about, is there such a thing as ideal communication and how we think about that. So, so I'm going to begin first with reminiscing about popular culture, since we've been in a Cavellian vein. And I only recently saw Blade Runner 1982. I mean, I tend not to keep up this thing, with these things the way Pauline does. Uh, the thing that's very striking about it is that there was a lot of technological prediction. No mobile technology. None. It's striking how absent it is from the film. So it's constructed on the basis of uh, Philip K. Dick's book, which had been written earlier, very, very imbued with the Turing test idea of whether you can identify on the basis of behavior or verbal behavior whether someone is a robot or not a robot. But as I say, there's no anticipation of the social factors. There are a few institutions depicted in this film except corporations, police, and urban street fair. I think there are these nice scenes of people eating in restaurants, but uh, no apps are in the picture. And there's no imagined hybridization of computer technology. So I think what's always important when you do philosophy is to think about the arguments that are not there you have to look at what a philosopher is not arguing for. Similarly here in the film, you have to look at what wasn't there. So for me, opera guys is very profound because of the dimension of the social that Jim and Mark are really insisting on, however malleably and, and schematically. So now I'll try to justify what that is. So looking back to our historical context for this theory, I think we should have a look at the Turing test one more time. You all have heard of this, I suppose. Alan Turing calls it the imitation game. What it really is, is a language game in Wittgenstein's sense. It's important that it is a game. And he used to laugh hysterically out loud reading passages from this. It was treated by the AI community as this sacred Bible. I think he dashed it off and thought it was kind of funny. The main purpose of that argument, from a logician's point of view, is that he is denying that we have any general criterion of intelligence. He's denying that. He's smart enough to see we don't have it. So just thinking like a logician now, to prove that you cannot do something is very different from proving that you can do something. To prove that there is an algorithm to make people act a certain way, you just build it. That might be hard, but that's what you do. To prove that there cannot be an algorithm, you have to have a general analysis of the notion of what an algorithm in general is before you can prove. So Turing's point in this paper was really, because we don't have a general analysis of intelligent behavior, 
we cannot not prove that the machine can. So this is very important. Second thing is, um, often the social dimension, the latently or incipiently social dimension of this game is widely overlooked. People look at it uh, from the point of view of the person behind the screen who is divided off from the social context. But in fact, the human on the other side is doing stuff. The human on the other side is trying to be recognized or acknowledged, to use Cabellian terms, by the person who's playing the game. And in fact, what Turing was doing here was setting up a kind of break or control on anthropomorphization. That is to say, he had played with computer games and chess, and he realized very early, I'm so tempted to say that the thing is thinking. Why is that? He decided that intelligence is really what he called an emotional concept. It's a response-dependent concept. And so the purpose of the Turing machine is not, I think, just some kind of epistemological skepticism or pure communication idea, but it's to put a control and have a human here and a machine here so that the tendency we have to anthropomorphize the machine is weeded out. Okay, so lots of grand claims from people in AI through the 60s about artificial intelligence and general intelligence. Turing, as I'll explain, didn't think any of that would really work. My picture of apparatus is you just multiply that picture. I only did it three times on my screen. But if you imagine multiplying it about a billion times across the whole Earth, that's what it is. And so now what you have is some people looking at screens, communicating with other people, but other people are watching them looking at their screens and talking over their shoulder about what they're saying while they watch those screens. And now we have words as part of reality commenting on machines. And this is all part of reality. And the reality I would respond to David is on one level, in some sense, this abstract sense. It's on one level, and therefore the idea of a meta theory or a meta perspective, where you could get down below some explanatory level in a stable kind of way, is not available for this picture. So I don't know whether that really makes operat guys to theory, but it makes it resonant with the foundations in a strict mathematical sense of what's happening with this particular technology. So, back to Cavell, the problem of other minds is more fundamental than the problem of the external world, than the problem of real versus virtual. But here it's a question of the particular ways in which we acknowledge others, the particular language games we play in showing ourselves and hiding ourselves. And the word acknowledgement is different from identifying whether something is human or machine. Acknowledgement has to take place in a kind of morally saturated situation of personas, everyday life. So it's not a matter of building criteria for being human or good or bad anymore. It's a question of the specific forms in which we recognize other human beings in that process of individuation that Pauline was just talking about. The Rousseauian idea is that we want to be freely recognized by others who are worthy of recognizing us. And we, they, we want them to think we are worthy recognizers of them. So this epideictic function of language, which Mark and, and Jim place at the center of the theory, it's about praise and blame and how this is all very, very important, I think, to the picture. And usually philosophers who think about AI leave that out of the picture altogether. They have a, a very unepidictic picture. They want the notion of information. They don't want the notion of praising or blaming or I like it or I'm responding badly to you to be part of the theory. To put it in Sandra Lohier terms, uh, we want to care. The person playing the Turing game cares if they get it wrong. That's why it's built up that way. They're going to feel badly if they call a machine a human. And in fact, when they do play the Turing game in actual fact, the, the judges who play it tend to be highly skeptical. And they tend to very often, very, very rarely, to, to be willing to say that something is human because they're afraid of making that kind of mistake. So again, it's an emotional concept as much as a concept of information. And I think it's, again, to, to Jim's and Mark's credit that you see that the social forces are what are driving the development and the use of this technology. So, 
My understanding, but now I will be no match for David's wonderful tour de force there earlier that the students missed on social theory. The usual categories here would be agency, structure, interaction, and change. And in Bourdieu, you do have this notion of the habitus. I also was a bit puzzled about what role the habitus might or might not be playing in this apparatus theory. Um, but you did have a move in the 60s and 70s to bring human actors and the notion of practice and everyday life into sociology. So here, Mazur, Giddens, and Hoffman are important influences on Mark and Jim's theory. They mention in the introduction to their book the notion of structuration, social change and its interaction with social institutions rather than technological determinism. So I think this is another excellent feature of their theory. We see anticipated in that image I have of billions of Turing tests going on all of the time because it's not that the technology is driving things on its own, it's that the sphere of the world in which humans talk to each other and use such things is now developing in a highly rich kind of a way. So, the limitations of structuration theories that Mark and Jim emphasize are these. Uh, they put people back in the picture, but they focused on particular domains of home, work, family. Even Granovetter's work, Granovetter being a wonderful sociologist, I know that Sandra has been studying, wrote about the strength of weak ties in political organization in Boston in the 1960s against urban renewal. Uh, but still the theory of weak ties contrasts family structures with extrafamilial structures. So they're still focusing on those kinds of structures. A, a major objection I gather at the time you wrote Perpetual Contact is the worry that Giddens and others are being descriptive and yet not predictive. So you can describe the way people use telephone communication in offices all you like. When are you going to be able to predict something? And I do think the major hallmark and victory of, of what you did is the number of salient predictions that you made that turned out to be true. 18 years later. It's a remarkable example of social science from my point of view. I don't know of any other theory with the range and scope and global nature that's been that good. So I do think this is important. Now, why were you able to make those predictions? I'm suggesting that there is something in the actual scientific matrix of logic that is behind this. It is an historical epic. But also because it's part of that historical effort, oddly, you might think, that not just pure information, but the actual content of what people say and mean and do is part of what's driving reality. So the press towards individuation, individuality, explicit and implicit reasons, this is what is shaping the forward development of the era. The mobile phone, I'll just read you from their introduction, presents a radically different solution to the phenomenon of absent presence than traditional mass media and the internet, such as information retrieval tools. The mobile telephone is a means to regulate one's social environment through integration of social contact, rather than simply inviting socially dispersing media into one's life. So again, David, you mentioned Merton, the whole idea of an affordance, the whole idea that you could use the phone to construct a social persona is part of the picture. It's not just that we have human relations that are somehow culturally fixed and we introduce a new device and things get disrupted. People are actually using it. Again, we've talked about this this afternoon and it is a puzzle. Uh, is the apparatus theory too universal? They saw a movement toward consistent patterns in the way people use personal communication technologies they're not predicted by the engineers who create the technology. And that was borne out. We have an essay in Philosophy of Emerging Media, which I mentioned because we ordered it for the course, by Richard Harper, who was a senior development officer at Microsoft Research and a big fan of Wittgenstein and Austin. And he wrote an absolutely wonderful essay called From Locke to Lynch uh, on the development of Skype. And the point is that the way the engineers designed Skype when they first ran it as a platform within Microsoft Research, they thought of it as an information exchange tool. 
they did not predict what people would actually do with Skype, which is to remain in touch with friends if you're vacationing, say hello to your grandmother, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, that shift from a pure disembodied concept of information to what it is to be informed, what it is to be able to act and have a self in a social setting, that's very crucial. The other thing to emphasize once again, as part of that picture of billions of Turing tests going on, people create folk theories and modify their rationalizations of the devices, constantly reinventing their uses of technology. The uses are dynamically adjusted to maximize needs and comforts and to invent new ones. Again, a very prescient observation. The engineers have one picture of what's going to happen. They put it out into the world and we adapt. And we adapt it using ideas and arguments and rationalizations. So this is what Jim's and Mark's theory wants to look at. And again, as a philosopher of logic, I find this absolutely fascinating because you want to look at epideictic discourse and how people defend their particular responses to a TV show or something like that. So, they did make some big claims though. So, I mean, I think my talk is really exploring with the extent to which this is true. We suggest, they said, there is a logic associated with communication technology. Indeed, this logic antedates the particular technologies that are currently with but was unable to be expressed without the medium. It sounds very Hegelian to me. We have uh, the development of Geist, you see, and it's holding forth, and somehow the philosopher comes at the end of this development, so I feel this is what I'm doing today. But anyway, this logic is grounded in broader ideologies that are rooted in historical, materialistic, religious, and ideational ontologies, and that dominated human attempts to contextualize and make meaningful their life experiences. I mean, I hope you can see students, this is, they're talking about all of human history. That's what they're doing. They're saying that PCTs are bringing this out. But it is like Hegel. They are talking about human evolution as such. So I think we shouldn't cover that up by calling them gifted sociologists. That's what they're really doing. So where does this German term come from? I like the idea of Vanessa of using a French term, of apparaille, uh, instead, but in any case. So apparatus here is a machine, and the social machine would be part of the understanding of that stuff. So you have materials for a task, equipment, gadgetry, the totality of means by which a function is performed, or social operations. And we have this nice word, apparatchik, which may not be familiar to the students, but means a person who is a bureaucrat working for the machine of the state. So. That's for operat. Geist, of course, as all of you who have read Hegel or Marx know, uh, can be translated as spirit or intellect, but in a sense of development, sense of moving, that we've talked about not losing hold of. You can't really get your hands on Geist until you begin to look at how people rationalize the existing political order and so on. Uh, Zeitgeist, I think David rightly questioned whether they really mean this, but I think, David, they kind of do mean this. They kind of do mean that the zeitgeist is very different. And I must say, if I think of Turing, probably the most important scientist of the last, what, maybe 300 years, they have got a point. I don't necessarily say he's the nicest or the best, but I think in terms of affecting science itself, and society, it's a big revolution. It's big. So, the cultural situation and limitations of extant technology, again, these were ideas framed in 1999, so they're 18 years ago, which also takes place within a group or collective, yet technological determinism is not required. In fact, technology does not determine what an individual can do. Rather, it serves as a constraint upon possibilities. The Geist refers to the common set of strategies or principles of reasoning about technology evident in the identifiable, consistent, and generalized patterns of technological advancement throughout history. Again, throughout all of human history, this is what they're saying. It is through these common strategies and principles that individual and collective behavior are drawn together. And again, the Mertonian idea of importance is, I think, good. All right. Then they have this idea of perpetual contact, which I would love to come back to and talk more about. 
An image deeply embedded in the, is the logic of perpetual contact. Somehow it's an ideal, Mark said during discussion, that somehow we have this drive for a perfect communication with others, that nothing will get in the way of us seeing one another. Uh, I guess one of my questions is, is perpetual contact a fantasy and positive dream, or is it a nightmare? Because it, it strikes me that perpetual contact would be a nightmare. So I think this was part of David's question about whether it uh, would be a normative ideal or not. Okay, I forget when I started. I don't know how much time I have. But anyway, I have three or four slides on Turing and three on Wittgenstein. Then I'll stop. When you think of a Turing machine, you should not think of the first picture I gave you of the Turing test. You should think of a large insurance company in London. It's a social setting. And what he was modeling was human calculative behavior. So Wittgenstein had a famous place where he wrote, Turing's machines, these are humans who calculate. So that's what it was, modeling that. And he did that for various reasons to analyze the notion of a step in a formal system of logic. He was analyzing what that is. But it was social from the beginning. The reason why we're talking about universals and the press towards standardization, I think, is because of the universal Turing machine. The universal Turing machine shows that you could build one, one Turing machine. And it could do the work of any particular Turing machine. Because a Turing machine is really a mathematical object consisting of a set of commands. That set of commands could be coded. And you could have a single framework for measuring computable functions. Now, this is quite remarkable because it means various things. Mathematically, what it means is what counts as being computable doesn't depend upon the particular linguistic system in which it's expressed. The notion of computability is absolute in a logician's sense. Gödel was amazed by this part of what Turing did. Normally, you would think that what's definable or sayable or inferable is a question of a particular language or language game. But the notion of computability is different. No matter how strong your theory, it's always the same group. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it shows that what's the most fundamental notion of logic is not the idea of a rule that you could apply everywhere. The most fundamental notion is the idea of a partial rule, one that only works for certain inputs and outputs. So suddenly, the notion of the way you get universality is by having partial rules and recipes, not total ones. That's a huge, important breakthrough in the theory of logic, and I think this is what struck me. So, Turing's philosophical perspective, in fact, I think was very shaped by his having been an undergraduate at Cambridge and having studied with Wittgenstein. Often they're regarded as enemies. I think they're great debts they have to each other on either side. So, Turing's own perspective, he read, I think, the Blue and the Brown book when he was an undergraduate. You can see places in the Blue and the Brown book which are incredibly like Turing machines. And it is one of the great questions how Turing came up with the notion of a Turing machine so quickly. The answer, I think, circumstantially has to be he saw the idea of a rule as a table series of commands employed by a human being in a localized context, et cetera, et cetera. So he, in fact, developed a philosophy of logic very different from what you would imagine if you just looked at the Turing text. Algorithms do what they do, but only against that human social backdrop of understanding, including what Turing called everyday phraseology and common sense. Algorithms are not, in general, simply neutral mathematical objects, but they involve qualitative aspects, meaningfulness, communicability. So when Mark Zuckerberg says, oh, Facebook's just a bunch of algorithms, don't blame me about fake news, mm -mm. not when you put it into motion in our social world. What we do and say about algorithms thus partly makes them what they are, and computer scientist Rohit Parikh has used to develop the notion of social software to think about this. An app is a piece of social software. So it's a subway system, 
So are many things around us. Elections, by the way, are pieces of social software. So we constantly have operating systems on which we write spaces of possible action. But it's very dynamic because, again, to your point, what people say about the algorithm, how they follow the rule, how they embed the rule in life, particularly social life, is part and parcel of what it is. So just to say, in 1948, in the founding document of AI, which Turing wrote as a report in London predicting remarkable things about the future. He stated that we should begin not from the bottom up. He thought the idea of trying to replicate a human being with robotics was a crazy idea. He said it would take you know, more machinery than we could fit in the Albert Hall. It would be ridiculous. It would be like building legs to go underneath a car. So that he didn't want. But he thought that we had to start in the middle. And that included our everyday social ways of interacting. So he said we need both discipline, which means formalization, standard protocols of communication, the ways in which the universal Turing machine can be coded up everywhere you like. But we also need the human registries, and he called that initiative. So in the end, intellectual activity for him consists mainly of different kinds of search. And there's a very moving passage here where he talks about Intellectual searches, those are searches where you build an algorithm to find a certain kind of number or calculate a probability. He then talked about biological or evolutionary searches, which is the search for the expression of a gene that can survive over time. But the third kind of thing he talked about was purely philosophical. There are no machines involved. He called it the cultural search. And he said the important thing about the cultural search is it's going to have to involve all of humanity over all of time. So again, these universals, I would submit, David, are not accidental. They seem to be part and parcel of the whole idea of putting into motion computability at the micro scale, social scale, even the macro scale. Computable processes are everywhere. We can model almost anything this way. So it's that ubiquity that is distinctive about the theory. By the way, I think he had been reading Peirce. I can't prove it, but they just discovered some philosophical notebooks that he kept touring when he was at Bletchley Park. I'm trying to get my hands on those. I'm sure we'll find some. So, to summarize, a different touring, one who would justify the Aparakais theory as, in some sense, a sociological approach that's based on something very profound. Logic and conversation, not psychology or primary. We offload routines to computers in order to interface with one another in a social world. And words and their uses are part of reality, and those are dynamic, and they're in constant evolution with what we do. And cobbling partial routines together in a community often will yield unforeseen challenges and unforeseen spaces of possible action. And it will require our constant care, sometimes artful and improvisational, to repair the social fabric of routine, as well as our human forms of life. And I'd like briefly now to say something about the notion of form of life, which Vanessa mentioned. I think this, much more than the notion of culture or practice, is what's needed for thinking about these things. First, I'll give another example from Richard Harper. Retailers, re retailers requested AI analysis of camera images that could tell when they filmed a customer entering the store, try to predict what the customer would like to buy. You have all these images, all these cameras, it's fantastic. On the other hand, the data set ontologies that they needed to use don't overlap with our human ways of acting, like being bored, showing off, lingering, comparing. It's just not something that will work. So frustration emerged at the design stage, and Richard Harper was brought in as a sort of philosophical therapist for this kind of situation. And he thinks it typifies an awful lot of things that are going on now. His points are these. The meanings of human action are complex and multifarious, multicolored, and they require many complex levels of analysis and description. And then when you give an analysis and description as an expert, again, to go back to David's points, being an expert putting those words in the world already changes how people are going to look at them. So again, I think the distinction between expertise and lay people is itself potentially a kind of shifting boundary, which from a positive point of view should mean 
a strong democratization of everything from journalism to science. You know, on, on the other hand, maybe it's a nightmare. I don't know. In any case, ethics should be prosaic if we talk with the engineers about what to do. Not general and fear-mongering and finger-wagging. There are problems, for example, with cyberbullying, but if you're really talking to someone who's coding, they're not going to be able to come up with a code that's going to take care of that problem. You have to know what kind of problem they can take care of. Another example he brought up was this one. People tend to erase their search histories most on Saturday morning. The first prediction was they're erasing their pornographic escapades during the week. But no, it turned out they're not being secretive and hiding. Uh, it's because they're bored. They want to clean out the search engine so they don't keep having shoe, shoe, shoes suggested. Or because maybe they wanted to buy a gift for someone, their partner, and they don't want them to see. Another point about this Abrakai theory that I really like is I think it's a form of experimental philosophy, which is not based on a fictive philosophy of mind, but has real potential to make predictions and see what's going on out there. And a lot of us have ideas about what's going on out there. And you know, they turn out to be wildly wrong about what's going on. One of the things I love about teaching students this material is you people know all about what's going on in ways that I absolutely don't. So um, just a couple words about forms of life, and then I'll stop. Uh, forms of life is a really important concept in Wittgenstein, but it doesn't come up very much. It's not like it's a sort of determinant theoretical structure of the kind, perhaps, David was asking for. It emerged, however, from a very interesting context in which he was up in Norway trying to turn the Brown Book into a book. The Brown Book had been a dictation to the students. And he gets to about November and he just fails. He writes a line through the manuscript and says, this whole thing is worthless. Then he was very upset for about three weeks. And then he broke through, but right before he struck out the word culture and substituted form of life for that. And if you look at Philosophical Investigation, which is the book that ultimately emerged, there are a couple of very interesting things about this. And he looked at Turing's on computable numbers during this very time he was composing the book. Form of life is deeper, more nebulous, more flexible, more evolutionary, and more biological than the notion of culture is something more schematic that plays a very important logical role because it's playing the role of what happens when people take rules and have to embed them into life. So uh, to imagine a language is to imagine a form of life. And I would say it in the investigations. What's taken now to be simple is important. What people take to be the simplest way of continuing a rule is very important. But there's no absolute necessity to that. Everything that's taken to be simple or fixed could be contested and turned on and rounded. And so he has finally gotten past this hierarchical picture of simplicity, which even in the Blue and the Brown book, if you think about it, it's like a, a sort of anthropological freeze, where you start with a very simple language game, and then you add maybe negation, and then you add. The problem with it is it's too anthropological. It's serial. It's as if it's a quasi-evolutionary Spanglerian picture of human culture. And he realizes by 1937, I think also partly because the Nazi party had ruined the word culture, he decided he didn't want that. And now what you have is this beautiful, very dynamic, multivalent orchestration of voice. So forms of life are not the quite same as the life world of a phenomenologist or the anthropologist, because these contain already meaningful, culturally saturated forms and holistic norms of living at the level of the whole world. Forms of life is rather a norm of elucidation of portions of human life. Wittgenstein talks about snapshots of human behavior, not something given to be described. So in a sense, the notion of praxis or practice is not the most fundamental notion. As Stanley Cavell emphasized, Forms of life have a biological as well as an ethological aspect. And finally, again, Sandra is here. Uh, she's something she's written a beautiful paper called Voice as Form of Life in 2015. They require the first person. How do I stand with respect to this particular protocol? How am I going to embed your way of embedding the word in your life 
in my way of embedding the word as I interact with you. So you will notice that in the Blue and the Brown book, first person experience only gets mentioned about 40 pages in. And when Wittgenstein mentions it, he says, I may have to take back everything I said before. In philosophical investigations, the first person voice is there from the absolute beginning, including the motto of the book and the quotation from Augustine, which is in the first person. So this, too, I think is very fundamental. So just in closing, again, David's question about universals and the constancies of cell phone use. And to your point, I don't think cell phone use is a culture. I think that's sort of not the, quite the right level, because it's not somehow differentiated enough. The examples that Wittgenstein has, you see, are very common to many periods of human life and phases of human life. Walking, chatting, playing, giving orders and commands, calling things by their names, pointing at things, feeling grief, describing things, constructing an object from drawings, reporting events, speculating about an event, making up a story, smiling at a newborn, playing with picture books and children, acting in a play, singing rounds, guessing riddles, cracking a joke, solving a problem in applied arithmetic, translating from one language to another, and again, requesting, thanking, cursing, greeting, praying. So this is the kind of broad level, not the notion of practice, not the notion of culture, that I think operat-based theory means. So I think I will just stop with that and uh, turn it over to Sandra.